So <clears throat> as I said, with Rajya Karpanja from the European Business School, we document this new source of media slant, uh, which we call the home country media slant. Uh, and we show that it distorts or affects equity prices across countries. Now, to motivate the study and to also elaborate on what exactly we mean by the media slant, uh, let me take a look at the following anecdotal examples. So let's take the Wall Street Journal, and let's take two editions of the Wall Street Journal, the US edition and the European edition. And then let's take two companies, the US company, General Motors, and European company, Volkswagen. And let's compare the news across editions for both companies. So the first example is about the GM. So GM experienced these large problems with faulty ignition switches. And then in September 2015, they reached a settlement agreement with the US Justice Department. And the both editions, European edition on the left and the US edition on the right, reported on this fact. Huh? Both articles were written by the same lead journalist. Both articles were published on the very same day. But what we see is that there are stark differences in the opening paragraphs of both articles. Whereas in the European edition, they merely focuses on the facts. So the GM will pay 900 million. This is related to the recall of millions of vehicles and more than hundreds of deaths. And then in the US edition, meanwhile, they emphasize that GM agreed to pay lower than expected financial penalty and that this is closing a chapter in a safety crisis. Huh? So while ultimately both articles actually talk about the same facts later on, in the opening paragraphs we see that the US edition is much more favorable or provides a more positive spin to the news. So now in our data, which is going to be coded on a scale from minus 4 to plus 4, the first article in the European edition got an overall tone of minus 1.14, and the one in the American edition got an overall tone of 0 0.16. Huh? Now, the very same day, September 18th, 2015, also marks the beginning of the Volkswagen scandal, the so-called Dieselgate. Huh? Since this was Friday, we then look at the printed editions of uh, uh, the European and the US edition of the Wall Street Journal the next Monday. Huh? Again, both articles were written by the same lead journalist, and they were published on the very same day. Huh? And again, we see differences in the text between both articles, as well as differences in the visual aspects, which I want to focus on in this example. In particular, in the US edition, you can see that the number, initial number of cars of fact that is in large font, in bold, and in red, Whereas in the European edition, it's buried somewhere in the text. Huh? There are also differences in the pictures. And one could argue that in the European edition, the CEO looks more confident than in the US edition. <laughs> huh? So in our data, the article in the European edition got a tone of minus 1.9, whereas the article in the US edition got a tone of minus 2.15. Huh? So what these two examples now kind of show is that in the US edition, they seem to be a little bit more favorable to American companies. In the European edition, they seem to be a little bit more favorable to European companies. Uh, and in this paper, we show that this is not an isolated case. And it's also not only restricted to the you know, international editions of the Wall Street Journal. Now, using a large hand-coded news data covering automotive industry across the US, Germany and Japan, we show that there is national newspapers systematically report more favorably about home companies than about foreign companies. And this is what we call the home country media slant. And we show that this is kind of consistent with the notion or with the idea that the media would be catering to domestic readers. And then importantly, we show that the media does not seem to be only reflecting the reader's views across different countries, but it also seems to affect investor beliefs as differences in the tone of news across countries predict equity returns, and they also predict differences in the ADR prices across countries. And those effects seem to be largest when readers are more likely to pay attention to news. 
So there's, of course, been a lot of work on that studies biases in news reporting, especially in the political sphere, uh, but also in the financial sphere, uh, and the effects of those biases on financial markets. But the focus of all these studies is on the domestic markets. You know, either within the US or within the UK, and the cross-country evidence currently is more anecdotal. Also, in these studies, typically, not always, but typically, national newspapers would be regarded as most reliable. Huh? And they have been used as a yardstick to measure biases in financial media, to measure biases in local media, etc. And in our paper, we show that national newspapers are also biased once you compare them across the countries. And we think that we have a cleaner test of media effects on equity prices for two reasons. Media markets across countries are segmented. Uh, so because of language barriers uh, and geographic distances, most of the readers are exposed only to news from their own country, which kind of limits the informational flow across the countries. And importantly, many companies are cross-listed. Uh, so when we test for the effects of media on prices, we're not restricted to only one price per country, but we actually have two prices in each country and two tones in each country, and we can actually relate that and come up with a cleaner test of media effects on equity prices. Now, we focus on the automotive industry, and we do so for three main reasons. First, car industry is in many ways iconic. It's very important uh, for national economies of the analyzed countries, especially in the historical context. And car brands still remain among the most recognizable of brands. Uh, so some people m would even call them symbols of national identity and pride. And this is especially true when it comes to Germany, but also in Japan and in the US, they're very important. Uh, so we believe that this is actually the setup, is the type of industry where one would actually um, expect that potentially readers have strong views um, about their national, uh, their national brands and the media may be actually cat catering to that. So another example would probably be Boeing versus Airbus, no? which has been mentioned today. Now, the second reason why we focus on the automotive industry is that car companies compete fiercely at the international level. And this is very important for us because we need to have media coverage across all three countries. And lastly, many of the car companies are cross-listed. As I mentioned, this is going to be very important for our tests of uh, price effects. Um, and last but not least, we also have very detailed data which comes from Prime Research, and it's uh, one of the leading companies in the field of media analysis for the automotive industry. So what they do is they actually employ native speakers that read and code articles in different countries and in different languages. Uh, and the coders are their employees, and they go through extensive training to ensure the comparability of the coding procedures. And the data is coded at the level of a segment of an article. Now, depending on how many car brands would be mentioned in an article, depending on how many different general topics would be discussed in an article, each article can be segmented into more than a dozen segments. And then for each segment that contains a value judgment, a tone would be assigned. On the scale from minus four being the most negative, to plus four being the most positive and zero being neutral. And besides that, we also have many other variables such as eight different general topics of news, time dimension of the news, whether the news is about the past, present or the future, references to experts, financial institutions, public entities, etc. And importantly, we have information also on the visibility or the reach of each and every segment or the article. Now for our sample of big three car companies, from each of the three major car producing countries. So in total, we're gonna have nine companies, three companies from each country. Um, for the period of last 10 years, so 2007 to 2016, we have across approximately 
800,000 observations. An observation for us is a segment for which tone is assigned, and they show up in over 190,000 articles, um, and they come from around 50 US, 50 German, and 10 Japanese newspapers per month. So the first thing that we do is we simply look at some summary statistics. So the unconditional average tone would vary between 0 and 1 approximately. On average, BMW would get the highest tone and GM the lowest tone. But one thing that sticks out is that when you look at the average news tone in the home media, so for example, for G uh, GM, home media is the US media, and the foreign media would then be the Japanese and the German media. But when you look at the home media news tone, it's always higher than the foreign media news tone. And as you can see in the very last row, this holds for each and every company in our sample. Huh? And we interpret this as the first indication for the existence of so-called home country media slant. But of course, these are just basically the simple unconditional averages. So we want to control for the fact that the news comes from different countries, from different newspapers, uh, etc. And we also want to control for some new specific variables. So we throw in a lot of fixed effects and other control variables in a regression of the new stone on a home dummy. Now here the estimated coefficient on the home dummy, which is presented in the red colors, is going to tell us by how much the new stone in the home media is higher than in the foreign media after we control for all the fixed effects and other news variables. And what it turns out is that this coefficient is actually fairly large, 0 0.3, huh? and it's highly significant. Now note that the scale for news is between minus 4 to plus 4, so 0 0.3 is actually substantial. And this is after controlling for many different fixed effects and control variables. And results hold not only when we compare all the newspapers across different countries, but also when we just focus on the three most important newspapers per country. Also, when we just focus on the different country pairs. So kind of interestingly, the biggest difference is when we compare US to Japan, and the smallest difference is when we compare Germany to Japan. But coefficient is always positive and significant. Now, we have a bunch of additional results. So first, we look at the subsamples of similar news. What I mean by similar news is that we look at the subsample when news about the same car brand would be reported in every country within the same week. Huh? And then we also restrict that the news should be about the same general topic of news. Huh? And or also about the same time dimension of the news versus Whereas the, you know, at the time dimension is the past, present, or the future. And what we note again, home dummy is always positive, significant, approximately the same as in the main sample, which suggests that we're not capturing some selective media coverage, but it's actually due to the more positive spin of articles in home newspapers. Next, we look at how uh, results actually vary with the uh, topics of news. Huh? So if newspapers care about the reputation, we should expect that slant would be lowest for news that are more verifiable. Indeed, when we focus on the topics that are easier to verify, and especially when the news is about the past event, there's hardly any evidence for the home country media slant. But when we focus on the news about the future events, especially when they talk about the events such as CSR and ecology and employee relations, then we see large and very strong evidence for the home country media slant. Now, home country media slant also varies over time and increases substantially during the bad times for companies, such as the Volkswagen scandal, the Dieselgate, or the Toyota crisis, their problems with unintended acceleration of their cars, or just generally on the announcement days of car recalls. Huh? On all these days, the news would be very negative, generally. But the difference between the tone of news in home media and the foreign media would increase substantially. Now, and finally, I want to return back to our <laughs> motivating examples from the, US, uh, from the Wall Street Journal. I think this is a particularly interesting case because many of the articles are written by the same lead journalists and published on the very same day. 
And also, both editions have the same ultimate owner. And because both editions are in English, they can be coded by the same PR employee. Huh? So we can additionally then control for all the journalists as well as the coder fixed effects and the cross fixed effects there. Huh? And we still see that the coefficient is positive and significant. It's somewhat lower though, but that's to be expected because both editions are in English, it's easier to compare and it's easier to detect the slant. So the theory would tell us actually that the slant should be actually somewhat smaller over here. Also, the European edition is not targeted directly to uh, Germans, but rather to the whole uh, Europe. So um, that is to be expected that the coefficient is somewhat lower here. Now, this brings me to the question is, what drives this home country media slant? Huh? The theory would tell us that there could be many different factors. On the supply side, this could be related to the preferences of journalists, editors, media owners. On the demand side, this could be reflecting the fact that the newspapers are catering to readers' preferences or priors or uh, their views. And the slant could also be driven by advertising effects or any special type of relationships between the journalists and the companies. Huh? Now, it's very difficult to actually uh, determine exactly how much each and every factor contributes um, to the media slant, but what we can do is actually we can use the theory to actually um, guide us a little bit. So, as we know, the relative importance of the factors uh, should depend mainly on the competitiveness of the media space. Uh, when faced with the competition, media would likely forego their own views and adhere or resist the pressure of the advertisers in order to keep the readership and to survive in the long run. So, when faced with competition, Media slant is more likely to persist if readers themselves have preference for biased news. Um, and Matthew has a lot of work in this area. And we think that this may be happening in this uh, situation as well because of the iconic status of car industry in the analyzed countries. Uh, so we, one can view them as basically a home team and the foreign car industry would be kind of the foreign team. So you could actually see that the readers would actually get some extra utility from reading news that puts the home car brands above the foreign car brands. Also, in each and every country that we have here, uh, there are many newspapers that compete for readers at the national level. Uh, so in this case, the theory would actually suggest that demand for biased news is actually a likely factor for home country media slant. And our evidence seemed to be aligned with that. And the uh, Wall Street Journal is actually the best supporting evidence for that because articles are written by the same journalists, same set of journalists, published on the same day, and yet we see the differences. Now, no, that easy as would be for the Wall Street Journal to actually just repeat the articles uh, from one edition to the other, but they put extra effort into catering the articles to different audiences. Yeah. And also we show that the results are robust to controlling for locked sales, which we use as a proxy for advertising. And there's some suggestive evidence that cross-country or country pair variation actually is related to the proxies with of national pride and political relationships, no? which all kind of supports the idea of the demand-based land. And this brings me to the last question. Um, potentially, you know, the most important question for us uh, that we're in finance, uh, does the home country media slant actually also affect uh, readers or does it affect investor beliefs and then does it have any effect on equity prices? Uh? Or in other words, does the media only reflect the views within the country or does it also have the effect? Uh? Now, we know that investors have access to many different sources of information, but the media gives news the credibility and creates common knowledge. So the way things are filtered to different audiences in different countries may 
also affect or reinforce investor beliefs. And we think that this is especially the case in our setup because countries, media markets are segmented across countries. Huh? And then effects could be particularly strong. So we do two, two tests over here, which both actually point in the same direction. First, we take a look at the domestic stock returns. Huh? We check and verify that the companies are held predominantly by home investors. So home investor, in our case, is the marginal investor. So then if home investor trades on home news, home country media slant may lead to temporary stock price over evaluations, followed by subsequent price corrections. Huh? So to verify this, we do a couple of different things. And here I'm just going to talk about the trading strategy that we consider, which we call betting against home media. Yeah? So if a company-specific new stone in a given month is higher in home country than in foreign countries, then we sell the stock of this company. Otherwise, we buy it. Huh? And then if in a given month there's no stock in either in a buy or a sell portfolio, we simply uh, invest in the risk-free asset. Huh? And importantly, we weigh the tone of news by visibility always. And this is important, and at least for this exercise here, we don't get ex the same strong results if we don't weigh by visibility, which actually makes also a lot of sense in our setup. So here are the results. So if we follow this betting against home media strategy, given that we only have a small number of companies in the portfolio, the portfolio returns are going to be fairly volatile. But on average, the abnormal monthly returns actually turn out to be fairly large in excess of 2% per month. Uh, and just uh, uh, to verify that we there's nothing special about the set of companies that we're considering, if we just invest in all the companies in our sample, then abnormal returns are zero. Uh, so we take this as the first suggestive evidence that media may actually be reinforcing or affecting investor beliefs. But there are two important caveats here. Very similar predictions would actually arise if media would simply reflect rather than affect investor beliefs. Also, in such a simple trading strategy, it's very difficult to control for all the possible sources of risk and differences in companies' characteristics. So that's why we next take advantage of the fact that stocks are cross-listed. Now, equity holders across countries are entitled to the same cash flows. So any effects that we document then cannot be driven by differences in companies' characteristics. Also, using the time-matched prices, we can then conduct the analysis at a daily level, which also enables us to actually separate between the samples when investors are more or less likely to pay attention to news. So <coughs> for this exercise, we focus on the American and the German car companies. And so American car companies are cross-listed in Germany, and the German companies are traded in the US as ADRs and or global shares. Huh? And what's important is that there's always the overlap in trading hours between Germany and the US, so that we can time match the prices between both, both markets. Huh? We then define the relative stock price differences as a price at home minus price abroad over price at home, and we regress that on the differences between the new stones, the home new stone and the foreign new stone. Huh? So we believe that this is a very nice setup because we have two prices and two new stones. Again, the new stone would be weighted by visibility. And here are the results. We see the positive coefficients and significant. Huh? which suggests that indeed, you know, there is the fact on the, that the differences in the tone of news are related to the differences, temporary stock price deviations across prices, uh, across countries. And note also that all the newspapers in our data are from morning editions. So effectively, these are predictive regressions. So this actually lends kind of a strong support for the notion that media does, that what media reports, and especially how media reports it, has an effect on uh, investor beliefs. And to further support this interpretation, 
we then look at the attention. Attention is a prerequisite for media content to influence beliefs. No? So <coughs> we should expect that when investors pay attention to news, then we should see the results. And when they are distracted, then we shouldn't see the results. Huh? So we use here sports as a distraction because sports attract tremendous attention and also they are largely exogenous to company-specific news. Huh? Um, so it is very likely that when there is a lot of attention to sports, uh, think of the Super Bowl of the um, uh, Canada versus uh, US hockey game uh, in the Olympic Games, uh, things like that, um, it's very likely that investors are going to pay less attention to company-specific news. Uh? So then we define uh, subsamples with ho high and low attention to sports. So we only look at the major sports across countries. So for example, for, the, for Germany, uh, we look at soccer, because soccer is by far the most uh, popular sport in Germany. And also we add the basketball. And just to show, oops, okay, that wasn't a good idea. Do you go back? <coughs> nope. Sorry, can you? Oh? No. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so not a Mac person. We don't person. have enough knowledge in the room to do this without the leader. Is it one of these? Please this one. Okay, just double click on that. Yeah, and then you click on. No, this one is not. Yeah, you can talk about power. <laughs> no. Uh, wait. So the red one X's out. Okay. So where is yours? This one. So where is the cursor? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here. This one. Yes. All right, let's try this. All right. Now the green one. Okay. Okay. Best not to click on anything. Okay, this is the slide that I wanted to show you, and thank you, Harry, for the help. <laughs> so this is just to verify, actually, that the Google search activity has credibility. So, for example, this is for Germany, and we kind of nicely see the spikes, uh, because soccer is the most important uh, sport over there. And we nicely see the spikes around the World Cups and around the UEFA Championships in Europe. Or, for example, in the U.S., we see nicely that most of the attention goes to the uh, American football, of course. But for example, there are s two actually extreme spikes for a hockey around the Winter Olympic Games when US actually plays against Canada. Uh, so this actually just kind of gives us uh, some ideas that there's credibility to using the Google search uh, activity as a measure of uh, attraction to sports and then as a measure of distraction for investors. So then we look at the subsamples when there is extreme activity on Google searches, when basically Google searches on sports are above the 5% or above 95th percentile um, in either of the two countries. And for those subsamples, as you can see it here in the red, we don't see any results. Uh, whereas when there's not that much uh, attention to sports, you see that results actually survive and are there. No? And we s interpret this as a further confirmation that what media reports, and especially how media reports it, actually also has a causal effect on, on investor beliefs and equity prices. And this brings me to the end um, of the presentation. So I would say that uh, we provide systematic evidence for home country media slant um, with regards to the automotive industry in the US, Germany, and Japan. And that exists for when we compare the domestic newspapers from different countries, as well as when we compare the international editions of the Wall Street Journal. And there is the evidence that this seems to be consistent with the notion of media catering to domestic readers. But media does not seem to only reflect the nation's views, but it seems to also reinforce or affect investor beliefs, as documented by the facts of uh, media on equity prices. Huh? 
No, we are focusing here on equity prices, but we believe there are some further implications as well. Eh? Because home country media slant could also affect sales. It could affect the cost, the cost and the ability of companies to raise or uh, capital or borrow. Eh? Um, also, it results suggest that people not only have more information about home companies, but they also seem to have overly positive information about home companies, now, which could explain partially the so-called home country bias, the fact that people overinvest in home countries. Right? And lastly, it seems that, you know, as if home media actually acts as a cheerleader for home companies, uh, which may also undermine the role of media as a watchdog uh, in providing accountability. Uh, I'm sure there are further applications as well, but um, I will stop right here. So thank you. Um, can you explain a little better the scoring system? Like you, I, you said, there's a company that scores the articles, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, do you feel that that the, the scoring could somehow affect the, uh, you know, like the, the, the two different articles are scored by different people? Maybe, like, how does that process work? Yeah. So of course, um, there's no such a thing as a you know, completely unbiased in a perfect uh, way of doing this, but the company uh, does everything possible to ensure the comparability of the coding procedures across countries and companies. So for, for one, um, everybody goes through rigorous training. Um, and these are the employees. It's not that they actually just kind of delegate that to some internet uh, type of uh, job and whoever wants to sign up can sign up. Uh, no, they're, they're employees, so it's a different thing here. Um, I've been to their place where they actually do that. Um, and there's always the possibility that coders themselves could be a little bit biased. Uh, so uh, we throw in the coder fixed effects, um, but uh, these fixed effects actually work only uh, really well only in the Wall Street Journal example, because both editions can be coded by the same person, so we can actually throw in then the journalist times the coder fix the facts, huh? and the results are still there. So we don't think that that's actually driving it. Huh? And also what is actually kind of interesting is that when you throw in the country fix the facts, which would actually kind of take care of the levels in the tone of news across countries, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually matter that much. So actually there are kind of uh, scaled approximately uh, right across the countries as well. At least that's what the results would suggest. Was there a, was the study done using only English language text? Uh, no, this is uh, English, German, and Japanese. Uh, so, except for the Wall Street Journal case where it's, of course, uh, both editions <coughs> are in English. Uh, and are we looking at online and print? Uh, this is just printed news. Okay, so what do you what do you think m you might expect in a world where people are consuming more news online for these brands? Um, it's a good question. I mean, the reason we're focusing on the printed editions is because they're stable. Right? The online editions, whatever is online, it gets updated every once in a while. So it's actually sometimes a little bit difficult. I mean, you have to have the exact timestamps no, so that you can actually do the comparisons. And then given that you have you know, some type of uh, differences also uh, across countries um, in times, um, that may actually make it a little bit more complicated. Uh, the company does actually also uh, nowadays analyze the online editions. Uh, and we did actually uh, repeat the study for the online editions as well, and we got very similar results. Um, but the data for the online editions is actually very scarce. 
uh, and it's kind of incomplete. So that's why we focus then on the printed editions. And also with the printed editions, then we can actually make sure always that, you know, these are the morning editions and that the news gets disseminated in the morning before actually the stock market opens, so. Yeah, so <coughs> I think this is super interesting. Um, I'm still not totally convinced about nailing down the causal effect of the news coverage relative to other, uh, the impact of just the sentiment of local traders and, and local investors. So as you said, many of the results could be driven either by markets reacting to the news or just that when there's bad news for these companies, when there's bad news for Volkswagen, investors in Germany respond to that due to their own biases or their own preferences in a more positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, like, the distraction stuff at the end is great and is a good step in that direction. You still worry that th that distraction can work through two channels. It, it could be that soccer news is crowding out news about Volkswagen in the newspaper, or it could be that everybody in Germany is watching soccer, and so the, those kind of retail investors are not trading on those days. So it still seems, still seems like, you could, uh, I, unless I'm missing something, it still seems like there's a consistent explanation for all the facts, which is just through investor sentiment locally. Uh, I mean, you're completely right that it's very difficult to get uh, a completely exogenous shock over here. So we, uh, we tried as best as we could. Um, now, we actually thought a lot about the concern that you have as well. Um, but we're a little bit less concerned that you are potentially here because um, Still, even if the companies would actually time when they actually want to release some information, you know, they could actually time it to release it during the, the Winter Olympic Games so that nobody's going to pay attention to it, especially if that's bad news. But still, it's, this, it's the same event that should be reported in both countries. Um, so we're looking at the differences over here. Um, and. I'm just, I, I think that yes, in some sense, it could still actually be the, basically the demand story or the kind of reflection of the investor sentiment. But I believe that we are pushing it as far as we can uh, here. I mean, the other way would be to look at some strikes when the news is not delivered, but those just don't exist actually in, in these countries in this time period. Actually, there's just one. Uh, so this, with the Google Sports, it actually was kind of the furthest that we were able to push it. Uh, but I do agree that it's really difficult to nail it down exactly. So. In the example that you showed us, um, both the German and the, or both the European and the US Wall Street Journal article had the same author. Um, but I wonder if you've also looked at cases where the authors might be different and if there's any kind of effect through you know, not necessarily um, just the customers of the newspapers, but on the journalistic end, if you have a relationship with a particular source or a company, you don't want to have them be reported very poorly on if you value that relationship in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you're alluding to the kind of the quid pro quo story there. Um, of course, those things are possible. Um, no, there are articles that are in both editions where the lead journalist is the same, but then, and the whole set of journalists is the same, and then sometimes the lead journalist is the same, but then the, there's like one additional journalist in one edition and not in the other edition, and sometimes the set of journalists is uh, just different, though that actually doesn't happen really often. So what we have in the data is we have the information on the lead journalist and we can actually control that with the, with the fixed effects in there. Huh? And we believe that this should actually take care of um, your, um, your suggestion or uh, the, the, you know, the quid pro, pro quo type of stories to a large extent. Huh? And I think the results would be interesting because it would tell you something about the process of news generation in different segments. Um, so exactly how the the slant or the differences actually emerge, or and you might have certain kinds of news where those fixed effects are larger, or certain types of firms where those fixed effects tend to be systemically larger than others, um, and so where you would see <coughs> more of that type of slant. Mm. 
Well, we, we did not look at the values of the fixed effects. We could actually look at that a little bit more uh, as well. Um, and sometimes, uh, at least uh, my, uh, my hunch is that basically some journalists would actually get added in the one edition just so that the, that article would be actually then catered better to the different audience then. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.